Honestly, Grimace wasn't the character that I grew up knowing. But when I first heard about Grimace, I was at Chuck E. Cheese. But it just so happens that Chuck E. Cheese has a purple mascot too named Mr. Munch. I know y'all remember that little ticket counter when you put in the tickets and the machine made a munching sound? That was Mr. Munch. But frankly, I didn't grow up knowing him either. The only thing I grew up knowing that was big and purple was Barney. I'm not saying that I liked Barney, but I knew more of him than I did of Grimace and Mr. Munch. But speaking of Grimace, I'm gonna go get that Grimace meal from McDonald's. So here he is. I'll see y'all later. I feel like in many ways, we've seen Claw Noir throughout the show. Now based on the trailer for the new Miraculous special, Claw Noir was supposed to be an evil version of Cat Noir. And when you think about it, while battling villains, Cat Noir has turned against Ladybug several times because he was under the spell of the villain. For example, Dark Cupid, Cat Blanc, Princess Fragrance, Despair Bear, and the last few scenes of Zombie Zoo. Now from that, I think Claw Noir would be a conglomerate of all those examples, if not worse. But besides his cataclysm power, how would Cat Noir be a more fearsome opponent? Let me know in the comments. Can y'all agree that Marinette is a good role model for a kid's show? I know at one point she said being Ladybug made her a better marionette, which means that throughout the show she learned a lot of life lessons that helped her grow as a person, like standing up for herself and just being a good friend to her peers. But it's not just marionette, the show itself gives life lessons to people of all ages, cause let's face it, kids may not understand everything about this show. Things like no one person is useless, the consequences of selfishness, and quote, Life may not give you the gifts you want, but the real gift is life itself. But yeah, this show is great for teaching life lessons, but the creators think that since superheroes are so engaging to viewers of all ages, why not combine that with teaching life lessons? Those are my prime takeaways from Miraculous, but let me know in the comments what's your favorite Marinette moment. Not Ladybug, Marinette. I said this in one of my previous videos and I'll say it again. I do not like Chloe Bourgeois. It's just every time I watch this show and this girl is doing something spiteful, in my mind I'm like, all oh, y'all get out of my way, I'm gonna deal with her. And the fact that she was also given a miraculous, and you know what? That's another thing. One minute this girl is ready to save Paris and be on the good guy side, then when someone pisses her off she either gets akumatized or is ready to get back at someone with a prank, or for no good reason bring the mayor into this. Speaking of the mayor, have y'all seen how Chloe treats this man? He bends over backwards for her and his wife and gets no respect in return. It's like he's their little punching bag. Like, I don't even know what else to say. But let me know in the comments, if Chloe was ever your classmate, what would go down? What would happen? Please, I would love to know. It took five seasons and eight years of fan fiction for us to see what Marinette looks like wearing both her and Cat Noir's Miraculous. Like the first time seeing this, I was too excited for the next season. If you were to write the next season of Miraculous, the end of the last episode is kind of like a teaser for the next season. Now I ain't gonna talk about what happens in that episode because like I said in one of my previous videos, I got a couple of friends who aren't caught up with the show yet. And this video alone is a spoiler because at this point, this drawing isn't considered fan fiction. However, if Adrian were to wear both Miraculous, what do you think that'll look like? I know good and well y'all got crazy excited when y'all saw the first time Ladybug and Cat Noir swap their Miraculous. This was back when season 3 was still in the works and all we saw before that moment were fan fictions. Drawings found online as if they did swap their Miraculous, but after seeing that one episode you get that excited feeling where you finally find out if the rumors are true. But I know y'all got even more excited when y'all see Alia wear the Ladybug Miraculous for the first time. That one episode was kind of corny, but I still liked it. It was still a good episode. But let me know in the comments, which two Miraculous holders should swap Miraculous in the next season? How many episodes throughout this entire show have we seen Lady Wi-Fi? My personal opinion on Lady Wi-Fi is that I don't like her power, simply because it's super easy to defeat her. Now, if you rewind all the way back to season one, you'd see that to defeat Lady Wi-Fi, you simply take out the Wi-Fi signal. And since we've got two superheroes, one can be battling Lady Wi-Fi and the other's taking out the Wi-Fi signal. And if it's that simple, 
it would only take five minutes to defeat Lady Wi-Fi. Also considering that she's been akumatized several times throughout the show. Specifically twice in season one. Yes, I am counting the puppeteer episode. Not sure if that counts, but what she makes an appearance in that episode. But yeah, do y'all rock with Lady Wi-Fi? Let me know in the comments. So even though I was a boy, I kind of sort of grew up with Barbie. I just wasn't all interested because, you know, it's not practical for a boy to play with Barbie dolls. Even though that's true, Barbie actually gave me inspiration to create fashion illustrations and drawings like the ones you see on my channel. But in my opinion, I feel like the Barbie franchise and the Barbie movie are great representations of a young girl's mind. Now the reason I say that is because when you think about it, a little girl playing with Barbie dolls may say something like, this is what I want to be when I grow up. Live my best life, nothing but my best friends, and everything is pink. But in the Barbie movie, Barbie opens the door to the real world and reality starts to come alive. I'm not trying to spoil the movie or anything because I haven't seen it yet, but I'm just speaking on the trailers. But yeah, that's Barbie. Ha! Vesperia is one of my favorite superheroes in this show. Honestly, I just couldn't rock with the energy of Queen Bee. All the bragging, the self-centeredness, and the fact that everyone knew who she was. Like, no, 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 no. Not anymore. And I already didn't like Chloe Bourgeois anyway. Like, if the purpose of bringing Zoe into the show to replace Chloe was the creator's main intention, then kudos to them. But talking about the drawing, a lot of y'all ask me what markers I use. I got no problem with that. But I use a combination of Copic, Ohuhu, Prismacolor, and Winsor and & Newton Pro markers to make these illustrations. I got them from any store that sells them, like Michaels, Blick, and anywhere else they're sold individually. But if you do like this video, leave a like, comment what you would like to see next, and follow for more. But anyways, here's Vesperia. Swear to God, this girl stays getting akumatized. If y'all know the show, the first ever time Chloe was akumatized, she turned into Ladybug's alter ego or evil counterpart, Antibug. I like that this episode featured two villains in one episode, but looking back on it because it's a season one episode, I'm thinking Antibug was a cheaply made villain. But that's just my opinion as of now because I know that's not what I truly think of Antibug. The reason I say that is because the show has a superhero, right? It's easy to make a character into an evil counterpart because typically they'll have lots of similarities. Like, for example, Antibug has Ladybug's yo-yo, Lucky Charm, Anti-Charm. The only real difference is the color of the outfit and obviously one's good and one's evil. Like, y'all get what I'm saying? But anyways, here's Antibug. If there were ever a miraculous character that I can relate to, it's Cat Noir, cause if I were a superhero fighting crime and all that yada yada yada, I'd be the only one cracking jokes in mid battle. Like there'd be a villain trying to blow up the city or whatever, and I'd be the only one that'd be like, my phone blew up last night, now this. And another thing, if y'all watch this show, this man had his heart broken at least a couple times. That's happened to me too, but we're not gonna talk about that. But on a whole nother topic, let's talk about the miraculous villains though. Like, no shame to the creators, but some of these villains, not really making the cut. Like, Gigant Titan, Guitar Villain, and Mr. Pigeon needs to go to fuck on somewhere. Like, according to one of the episodes from either season 4 or 5, they kicked his ass 72 times. Like, come on now. But my personal favorite Miraculous Villain is between Stormy Weather and Party Crasher. But comment below who your favorite Miraculous Villain is. Y'all must love Lady B. And... Actually, let me talk about the episode she made an appearance in. I think it was Optigami? Listen, in this episode, Shadow Moth put so much thought into his plan. Like, I'd have to admit, if Ladybug didn't catch that handshake at the end, then Shadow Moth would have got it that day. And at the same time, he had Natalie as like his base of operations, making sure they get everybody one by one. And as a cover-up, he re Style Queen. Like, the last thing people would think about would be a Santa monster spying on everybody. But this might go down as one of my favorite episodes, not gonna lie. But out of all the episodes in the show, which episode from any season, not counting the specials, is your number one fave? Or at least in your top five. Got a lot of requests to do Tiana, so here we go. 
So if you guys don't know, a couple months ago, Disney announced the making of a live-action Princess and the Frog movie, and it's rumored online that Jenna Ortega will be cast as Fiona. Don't quote me on that, but I found that online. Respectfully, I'm not sure if Disney is recreating each princess one by one, or experimenting with changing the race of each princess in a live-action version. I don't know. But with my drawing, once I got close to finishing it, I found that I accidentally screwed up one of Tiana's eyes. But you know what? I'm gonna fix that. Just cut it out with my X-Acto knife, replace the hole with a piece of cardstock, and re-illustrate just the eye. This actually isn't the first time I did this to accommodate for the screws I make with my drawings, but that looks much better. Don't you think? I'm gonna be so real right now. Miss Hound's character design just seems so obvious. It's very easy to tell that Miss Hound is Sabrina because her superhero outfit is very similar to her normal clothes. And then her hair doesn't change at all either, so it makes it even more obvious. I'm not trying to say it's a bad character design. Miss Hound is really pretty, not gonna lie. But I felt like the overall design was rushed, like something that was just thrown together. Personally, I rock with the entire color scheme of Miss Hound. The yellow, the terracotta, and the contrast of blue in her eyes. But you know what? That's just the artist in me talking. Now I know I don't often talk about the powers of the dog miraculous, but let me know in the comments if Miss Hound would be on your super team. In my opinion, I feel like the Barbie franchise and the Barbie movie are great representations of a young girl's mind. Now the reason I say that is because when you think about it, a little girl playing with Barbie dolls may say something like, this is what I want to be when I grow up. Live my best life, nothing but my best friends, and everything is pink. But in the Barbie movie, Barbie opens the door to the real world and reality starts to come alive. I'm not trying to spoil the movie or anything because I haven't seen it yet, but I'm just speaking on the trailers. But yeah, that's Barbie. Just to let y'all know in advance, I tried to match the colors as close as I could to Rena Furtive's hair, so please don't destroy me in the comments. But talking about Rena Furtive, can y'all agree that the season 4 finale strike back was a very epic episode and it's one of the only few episodes that Rita Ferdinand makes an appearance in. Like just watching that one scene where the entire team finds out about Rita Ferdinand, that just gives me an instant reminder of what happened during season 4. Now you know once Alia received her new role and her outfit readapted to what I'm drawing, Ladybug told her that it had to be kept secret. She wanted everyone to believe that no one possessed the Fox Miraculous in order for Rena to spy on villains and cover for everybody. Now, Alia was reluctant on telling her boyfriend, but it ends up coming out. That's then revealed to everyone in the season finale. Like, there's a lot to say about this scene, that's why it's one of my favorites. But let me know in the comments, do y'all rock with the OG Rena Rouge or Rena Furtive? Y'all making me run my skin tone markers dry. But I don't take it as a bad thing. Like I said in the past, I appreciate every last comment I see. Speaking of which, some of y'all have been asking what supplies I used to draw. Now, I use a combination of Copic, Ahuhu, Prismacolor, and Touch Twin markers to color these drawings. In addition to color, I use Prismacolor colored pencils if I need them. And I also use a Pigma Secura brush pen for the outlines of these 6x6 drawings. I also use a smaller brush pen called the Pentel Sign Pen for any small spots that require a brush pen. Then as a highlight, I use my pasta pens. I use them for the eyes, the shine on the hair, and anywhere else that needs highlights. But yeah, that's just a few of the supplies I use. Hope that answers your question. On the other hand, here's Snake Noir. I think Reflecta is one of the only villains in this show that actually has a good reason for getting akumatized. Reflecta is a season 1 villain so no matter where you are in the show, you have to know this episode. But I have to say, I don't blame her. I do not like being ignored. I would want my voice heard. I mean, I was never locked in the bathroom but who wants to be shunned away like that? But getting back to Miraculous, this just comes to mind. Some, not all villains in this show, have a good motive for being akumatized. Like, for example, Dark Cupid was turned down and made fun of by a girl he likes on Valentine's Day. Roger Cop was unfairly fired by the mayor abusing his power. And Lady Wi-Fi was suspended from school for no reason. But let me know in the comments, if you were akumatized, what supervillain powers would you have? Whoever sent you this video wants you to know that you're the best mom ever. Existed. I don't care what anyone says about you. You raised me all these years, made me the person I am today, and can't no one take that away. I might not have a physical gift to show you how much I care, but in addition to this video, 
I wrote you a poem. Trees are green, some flowers are yellow. Here's a special drawing from your young fellow. God bless you and everything that you do. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. You guys know it would be cool if Miles Morales had his old live action Spider-Man movie. It would have been cool to see him and Spider-Gwen in No Way Home, but I kept forgetting that the Spider-Verse movies aren't a part of the Marvel storyline, so Miles Morales would need a way to enter the Marvel storyline. But speaking of that, the scene from the Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness where he breaks through different dimensions, you'll know that scene with the Scarlet Witch. I feel that Miles Morales could have made a small appearance there because one of those dimensions that they were breaking through to was a cartoon dimension. But if there were to be a live action Miles Morales movie, who do you think would be the leading role?